and Design in the MFAH, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Cindy holds a BA in, in, with honors in art history from Hamilton College and an, and an MA in the history of decorative arts from the Cooper Hewitt Parsons School of Design. She is responsible for the acquisition, research, and exhibition of post-1900 decorative arts, design, and craft. She has created over 20 exhibitions in her field. The themes of her exhibitions range from the language of contemporary metals, art and memory, ornament as art, and the avant-garde jewelry. She also specializes in con contemporary architecture, fiber, and ceramics. Cindy has authored and contributed to four major catalogs on craft and design media, as well as written extensively for, for journals. She delivered lectures on craft and design topics at museums across the United States and during national symposia and art fairs. Speaking of avant-garde, Cindy, Cindy, planned, Cindy planned to give a different lecture here tonight. <laughs> However, about a week ago, she attended the design fair in Milan, where she found herself involved in an intense and inspiring discussion about the design field and its contemporary crisis of practice in the real world. A real world where commodity, marketing, and money are the prevailing forces and creative design turns into an empty shell. Apparently, this discourse is so up to date that we will all profit from her existing exper exciting experience and will be driven deeply to this discussion tonight. <laughs> Our second years has spent the whole morning with her, squeezing out what they can before they head for the new pro promising journey. As the first, first years will do, will do as such tomorrow at a less intense, but nonetheless fruitful table crit. I myself found out that Cindy wrote a book about glass and because I'm into glass lately, I will certainly find ways to grasp more information in that direction. So if you want to challenge me for her short time with us, please remember that first of all, Cindy is a curator, and this is the best opportunity to squeeze, cuddle, and hug out whatever information you have about this world we are going to engage with. Please help me welcome, with warmth, Miss Cindy Strauss, who comes to suggest a critical evaluation of historic ideas in our state of the art era, as well as stretch points in the discussion of the integration of design, arts, and crafts in all media. I'll start off by, by thanking Iris for inviting me to come and spend a few days here at Cranbrook, which this is my second visit here, and uh, it is certainly one of my favorite places, and I was completely energized by my visits with the second year soon to be graduates this morning and I'm looking forward to spending the rest of tomorrow with the rest of the metalsmithing department and um, also thank you to all of the students in all the departments. I know this is a terribly busy time of year so I appreciate you spending about 45 minutes to an hour with me. So as Ronit mentioned, we are going to talk this evening about um, the return of the manifesto and its impact on craft and design. I think that all of you are well aware of some of the most significant manifestos uh, that impacted art in the 20th century. And it's fair to say that during periods of upheaval and unrest in the arts, some of the most provocative, dynamic, and change-inducing writing has come in the form of manifestos. And there are too many examples from the early 20th century to enumerate, but just three that I wanted to pique your interest on uh, up on the screen, the Futurist Manifesto, by Marinetti from 1909. This is the second Dada Manifesto by Tristan Zara from 1918, and um, André Breton's Surrealist Manifesto, just to name a few. These uh, types of artistic manifestos encapsulated and promulgated aesthetic and philosophical arguments and often provided a call to arms to artists of their generations. 
They replaced familiar principles with new ones because in their minds, the old ones had failed. I need to put on my glasses. <laughs> Sorry, I'm new to the land of glasses and I forget sometimes that I can't see as well as I need to. In the fields of architecture and design, manifestos played no less an important role. Pieces like Adolf Loos's Ornament and Crime from 1910, Frank Lloyd Wright's Organic Architecture, also from that same year, Walter Gropius's Bauhaus Manifesto, Van Doesburg's De Style Manifesto I, and Corbus' Towards a New Architecture Guiding Principles from 1920, all codified new ways of approaching architecture and objects, placing them within contemporary culture. We are still very much feeling the effects of these transformative design philosophies today. And what's interesting about um, many of the architecture and design related manifestos is that there was more attention paid to their graphic design. They were objects in and of themselves as different from the Dada manifestos as they continue to get added on to take on that same graphic uh, object quality. But um, it's really, I think, in the architecture and design ones from the early 20th century that you start to see these things taking on that object design role. As we move up into the mid and late 20th century, the manifesto remains a favorite tool of architects and theorists. But apart from the limited artistic and academic circles that they emerged from, they had little impact on the larger world outside of the arts. There are exceptions, of course, including treatises by Salowit, Lucy Lepard, Dieter Roms, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, Rem Koolhaas, to name just a few. And their wide impact is well documented. But for many cultural observers, by the time we reach the 1970s, 1980s, the time of the manifesto seems to be over. But that has all changed. Today, with the rise of the internet, the manifesto is back, and it's back in a very big way. But these new manifestos have often taken on a very personal rather than a collective thought point of view. And because of the ease of the internet, their sheer proliferation and wide-ranging content can often mean that their power to shape dialogue is neutered. Yet on the flip side, the distribution methods that are afforded by the internet and new technology can also offer exciting opportunities for interconnectivity, response, and dialogue. One recent example that harnessed a new method of distribution is Matthew Friday and Carrie Ann Quick's The Effective Craft Manifesto from 2014, which was written with their jewelry and metal smithing students at SUNY New Paltz. This, mess, this manifesto, quote, attempts to address the ethics of contemporary craft from the point of view of the relations that it fosters. It also argues for, quote, a type of approach that recognizes that craft objects never exist in isolation, rather they unfold as events that include networks of history, performativity, and materiality. Now the authors had a stated aim with their manifesto to provoke discussion, and so they posted it online, which shouldn't seem that surprising, but they posted it online to the website of the Journal of Modern Craft, a peer-reviewed, old-school academic journal, which says one thing about the kind of audience that they were trying to reach. But they also licensed their manifesto under the auspices of Creative Commons, which preserves intellectual property while allowing responders to alter and further distribute the document. So they actually could create their own sliding scale of parts of the document that they controlled and parts that users and responders could alter and add to the conversation. Within this experiment, 
the response has really been centered in the academic community. And I think that is part of the fact that they worked within SUNY New Paltz and their students and fellow professors to respond to it and also their choice of the Journal of Modern Craft as their online um, place to post it. So given this, um, Friday and Quick are hopeful that their manifesto will have further legs and that it will ultimately speak, speak to, quote, the curious and the conflicted, which is a great way of describing uh, our larger field in the craft community. <laughs> But as Friday and Quick's technological distribution of their manifesto, this type of distribution is becoming more and more the norm. But what I really want to return to and focus on is the power of print and the objectness that a printed manifesto affords, not to mention the design and artistic possibilities. And deciding to put your manifesto forth in this format really links it and its content to a history and a continuum of the kinds of important historical examples that I mentioned at the beginning. So two examples that we'll look at from the recent past are Brett Littman, Mary Jane Jacob, Lena Vigna, and Veronica Willman's New Paradigms in Curating Craft and Design, a manifesto from 2006, you see it here, and Bruce Sterling's An Essay on the New Aesthetic, into from 2012, both of which chose to appear in print. So some of you may have been at the 2006 National Conference that the American Craft Council put on. It was actually in Houston, and it was three full days of lectures and panels on a wide-ranging uh, series of topics that were meant to kind of take the pulse of craft and help direct the future. For Littman, Jacob, Vigna, and Willman, their panel addressed the what was considered then, remember 2006, the new practice of integrating craft objects in contemporary art exhibitions. And the manifesto's 53 statements were considered guideposts to think about in terms of ways we might want to approach new directions. In looking back at these statements, they seem um, rather quaint now, considering, and, and it's telling, this is not even 10 years ago, how far um, the field has, has come. So when you start to look at this first series of statements here, um, it's all pretty straightforward. Um, it is you know, along, along the lines of, um, everything human involves craft of some sort, foodie culture. Um, think about craft as an unused source in the field of visual culture. Craft is a great story. Craft can be ugly, etc. cetera. Um, so they do kind of seem tame and, um, and a bit quaint in that. But believe me when I tell you, and for any of you who were there can attest to this, that this document was a lightning rod for this three-day craft conference. And that was because um, some parts of it took on a very preaching and very condescending tone. For example, points like, do not overlook the obvious, such as trends that infiltrate contemporary culture, but be careful how you use it. Be direct with language. Do not confuse process and craft or one of my favorites, a vessel on a table is not a sculpture. <laughs> These kinds of statements and the fact that they came from museum professionals who were more associated with contemporary art absolutely infuriated the audience of over 600 artists, educators, collectors, curators, administrators, enthusiasts, people took to the microphones in the aisles and just flipped out. <laughs> um, and it was because you had these four people who were proposing a different value system than one that had been used previously in craft, 
one that prioritized plurality and social engagement over skills and object-based displays. And again, remember, 2006 is really, to my eyes today, it seems so, um, it seems so silly at how, how people thought this was a complete crisis, that there was never going to be a skilled object made again um, in any of the craft media. And so even today, people who attended the conference and who were upset about it, and imagine a significant portion of the audience, um, for them, the take-home uh, message of this entire conference, not just this panel, but this whole three-day conference, was reduced to this. The future of craft is one where objects are deprioritized, traditions of making discounted, and aligning craft with contemporary art is the end-all, be-all goal. Artists and educators in particular were quick to reassert the importance of the singular object, placing it in relation to craft history and underlying its importance as a cultural signifier. But whether this manifesto or the reaction to it in Houston or beyond had any real measurable effect on craft practice was really not the author's point and they tried to say this over and over again. But what their point was is they wanted to engender debate and conversation, and that's exactly what they did, perhaps the most seen in years around craft issues in America, which ultimately brought collectively the field together, whether individuals agreed with each other or not. It's interesting to note in hindsight, and I hadn't actually looked at this manifesto since probably 2006, and so it was interesting for me to see that uh, Littman, Jacob, Vinya, and Willman's manifesto foreshadowed a current debate in museology relating to craft, the role of social practice in, craft, in museum exhibitions. And just so I'm clear, the debate surrounding this topic is not whether this genre of work should be shown in museums. That's not debated. But it's rather how can social practice-oriented work be authentically documented? Can they be collected, these projects? And how do museums whose model is based on encyclopedic collections rather than act as a Kunsthalle deal with this type of artistic practice? Because museums, of course, traditionally, or I should say collecting museums, traditionally play the role of archive rather than instigating social engagement through art and culture. So when seen through this lens, Littman, Jacob, Vinya, and Willman's text is part institutional critique, i.e. asserting the institution as a driver of the larger cultural dialogue. And what I'm showing you are two of the exhibitions that they talked about as part of their panel as examples of ways that craft-based material and practices could be integrated um, within larger contemporary art exhibitions and issues. So their manifesto is really written from the perspective of asserting that the museum is the cultural driver of, of dialogue, as opposed to what happened with the new aesthetic, um, which was the opposite side or, of, um, or the opposite force, I should say, of a driver of dialogue, because this concept was established by a group of British artists, writers, thinkers, including James Bridle, who became the de facto speaker for the group, and it initially engaged people through a tumbler. Here's another, um, some images of the possible exhibition which I don't know if any of you got to see this in Berkeley this past year, but it was incredible and probably one of the most exceptional and successful exhibitions um, that I've ever seen dealing with social practice. So the new aesthetics Tumblr crowdsourced images and ideas documenting the rise of the visual language of new technology. James Bridle explained, quote, one of the core themes of the new aesthetic that has, has been our collaboration with technology, whether that's bots, digital cameras, or satellites, and a useful visual shorthand for that collaboration has been glitchy and pixelated imagery, 
a way of seeing that seems to reveal a real blurring between the real and the digital, the physical and the virtual, the human and the machine. So here are some of your uh, everyday pixelated images that are coming into our society. And this is James Bridle's work, um, an installation that he did at the Victorian Albert Museum called um, Five Eyes Hyperstacks, which uses objects and archives from the V&A's collections to explore the nature of structural and institutional power. So that um, you have objects from the collection here, 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 and they are displayed on top of these, which he calls hyperstacks, which contain an analysis and re-rendering of the Victorian Albert Museum's digital data. And that uses semantic analysis and so-called weak artificial intelligence to explore the connections between objects. Bridle went on to say that the new aesthetic it should be clear that this look, this pixelated look, is a metaphor for understanding and communicating the experience of a world in which the new aesthetic is increasingly pervasive. At South by Southwest in 2012, Bridal organized a panel on the new aesthetic that was attended by the author Bruce Sterling. Sterling published a manifesto-like response in Wired Magazine later that year that acknowledged, quote, there are truly many forms of imagery nowadays that are modern and unique to this period. We're surrounded by systems, devices, and machineries generating heaps of raw graphic novelty. We built them, we programmed them, we set them loose for a variety of motives, but they do some unexpected and provocative things. The new aesthetic is a rather old and hearteningly traditional story about a regional generational cluster of creative people who are perceiving important stuff that older, other, and dumber people don't quite get yet. It's a typical avant-garde art movement that has arisen within a modern network society. And here's Paul Coxedge, White Light. What, uh, this is the same work that runs on a loop and um, deals with pixelated imagery that sort of fades out or fades up, if you will, as you move through it. It's a motion-censored work. So what has this meant in design? Uh, because at this point in 2015, the new aesthetic is well-established. Um, many people might even say it's over. And yet, I was in Milan last week and saw these two new designs for Moroso by two extremely prominent industrial designers. Uh, for the brook seating that you see on the left-hand side um, with its uh, distorted, torqued forms, I'm not kidding you when here's the description of the, um, how the designer created these. He said and admits, it's difficult to express originality in the world because of the homogenization caused by technology. So he's understanding that construct. But then goes on to say that these shapes were formed in the process of playing with 3D technology and that the shapes and lines happened accidentally. And he's holding this up as a new frontier, a new step in the direction of technologically driven design. And um, no, I hope I won't offend anyone by saying I think these are terribly boring. And they are not what I would call cutting edge design. Um, on the right hand side, Ron Arid, an a architect and designer whose work I love and we collect strongly in the museum, um, has returned to his 80s roots uh, in the form of this sofa, uh, sort of tipped upside down column form. But for our purposes, the upholstery, and they showed this design in um, a number of different colorways, references the kind of electronic static that people used as um, a way to 
pictorialize the new aesthetic, moving from dark into gray matter. Again, not what I would call really cutting edge. Now, Bruce Sterling's text criticized things just like this, but it also offered praise and a challenge to artists and designers to, quote, fully disengage from the older generation's mythos of phantoms and masterfully grasp the genuine nature of their own creative tools and platforms. Otherwise, their designs will lack comprehension and command of what they are doing and creating, and they will be reduced to the freak show position of most 20th century tech art. That is what is at stake. He also even more directly goes on to say, quote, a heap of eye-catching curiosities doesn't constitute a compelling world view. And three years later, I would say these designs don't um, constitute a compelling world view. So for many people in the tech art field, Sterling's text gave the new aesthetic weight, legitimizing and advocating for it. He turned something that was probably a thing, but not fully articulated or acknowledged into a thing that everyone was talking about. And keep these images as sort of the watered down version of what's happened three years later when you look at some of these images that really um, seem to engage the kind of principles of the new aesthetic in a much more fundamental way. Uh, they are offering that sense of movement, that sense of pixelation, that sense of frisson um, that the new aesthetic is grasping for um, in useful objects. And there were literally thousands upon thousands of responses to Sterling's forceful prose. Um, Kyle Shakaya, an editor at artinfo.com, wrote one of the most compelling responses, asking, what does it mean to hack or deconstruct or remix an old aesthetic instead of creating something new? And it can mean this. The new aesthetic isn't impressionism or cubism. Revolutionary art is not shocking and provoking society as it did in the case of Monet and Picasso. The new aesthetic represents a ground level change in our existence. Instead of shocking society, new aesthetic art must respond to a shocked society and turn the changes we're confronting into, into critical artistic creation. So let's look at these two examples a little more in depth. The good vibration storage cabinet over to the left is made with a robotic router uh, a, a, an arm that, a robotic router arm that goes ahead and carves this distorted decoration. Um, the artist designer started with what he called wannabe replicas. So I want to be a Renaissance revival cabinet. I want to be a Chippendale type cabinet. And he went ahead and scanned those images, distorted them, and then programmed uh, the router to be able to carve them in what I think is a pretty fantastic work of art. On the right-hand side, this diffuser cabinet um, comes out of uh, acoustic research. And so the placement of each one of these pieces of wood, which forms this overall pixelated design, optimizes sound within your room. So two pieces responding to the new aesthetic ideas, but also having true function. Perhaps um, one of the, the most exciting designers to kind of harness this research-based practice is Joris Larman, uh, who is based in Amsterdam. And um, two works from his most recent collection from 2014, the Pixel Maker Chair, uh, which is out of resin and is 3D printed. What Larman did was he created a series of 12 chairs out of different materials, each of the same form. He created what he called kind of the every form for a chair, 
one that was ergonomic, one that worked well for dining, as well as uh, in a lounging type of environment, and then using both additive and reductive processes in wood, in metal, and in resin, uh, transformed each chair. And with the pixel version that you see here, he was very much responding to this new aesthetic type um, of imagery. On the right-hand side, part of the microstructures um, series that he did of three different chairs, this is the gradient chair, um, that ranges from um, hard to soft, so that as you get further up, the, there's a better way of looking at it, further up these points, it gets softer, and at the bottom of them, it's harder and more structural. Um, this is out of a um, polyurethane material, and uh, it has great qualities to it. And when you see it and walk around it, because of the way all of these individual elements have been printed, um, you get a sense of movement, and um, of, it almost blurs as you kind of uh, work your way around it. Artists are really only just starting to take the raw material of the new aesthetic and aestheticize it in a conscious, intelligent way. 3D imaging and printing are taking the machine aesthetic into physical space. Bruce Sterling argues that we can't depend on machines and code for our definition of beauty. And he's right. Rehashing that kind of technical imagery is not the answer. But as the latest generation of artists, writers, creatives, and people on the street can attest to, we aren't letting machines pioneer the new aesthetic avant-garde. We already live it. And that is Kyle Shaika, from, whose name I'm probably butchering, from artinfo.com. But just to think about a couple um, more examples of this kind of work that is taking the idea of 3D technology into some aesthetically really, really interesting directions. Um, the t-shirt issue on top, some of you may have seen their work. It is just phenomenal in person. Um, they were trying to create a three-dimensional printed t-shirt then this one um, takes the triangular polygon as a start and is um, nominally based on Edward Mybridge, the pioneering photographer uh, who documented uh, animals and people in motion. And United Nude, um, on the bottom here, these shoes here called Float, uh, you can actually print them at home. They provide that open source material if you are lucky enough to have a 3D printer. Um, the ones over here, a bit more complex and can't do it at home, but their goal was um, to give designers the largest amount of sculptural freedom using 3D printing. And um, both of these shoes are made of nylon and rubber so that you do have structure. They are completely functional. Um, another pair of artists who are very much kind of harnessing technology but pairing it with historic objects here where you have this kind of transition from object made, object scanned to printed object. Um, and this series is called Aerial Remarks on the History of Things. We're here, they're considering in issues of authorship um, and recontextualizing these historic and handmade objects um, using 3D modeling. Within um, the realm of jewelry, we're also, I mean, there's tons of 3D printed jewelry online. Um, frankly, the majority of it is really banal and um, all of the same form, but there are um, a number of artists who are dealing with these, um, the aesthetics of this movement and doing it in some very interesting ways, not necessarily engaging 3D printing in itself, but actually thinking about things like emojis uh, with Hillary, or excuse me, Mallory Weston, and Soo Young Kim um, with the way that she is using 
uh, film to um, both reference gemstones, but also the kind of abstracted pixelation that you see here. And a really intriguing artist named Frank Conant, who um, works with electroforming and does these incredible small-scale sculptures that um, are waves of pixelized uh, forms that come together um, in a pretty molten and free-floating way. And then finally, um, Kat Mazza, who has animated interviews of individuals in the labor movement and um, captures these stills, pixelates them, and then cross-stitches them in, um, with fiber. So I would say that um, you know, as we've gotten 2013, 2014, et cetera, we can see that the new aesthetic has come a long way and has become more object-oriented, uh, the lack of which was a criticism of the origin of its ideas in 2012. So moving along um, to my most recent example in Milan, I think that, um, well, I'm happy, I will go on the record by saying that 2013 and 2014 at the Salon de Mobile in Milan was completely disappointing. And the sofa fairs in Chicago were right up there in terms of a lack of being able to see new, interesting, challenging, provocative, however you want to describe it, work. And over the past few years, a chorus of prominent designers, artists, critics, and curators began to say that these once important venues for the introduction of new ideas and forms were dead. It was not that there was a complete fallow period of creativity, which can happen through cyclical ups and downs, but it was more that economics were the driving force of what was being produced and shown at these fairs. In response to this situation, artists, designers, and galleries dropped out of what had formerly been two of the most important venues for showing new work. In the craft world, which is less organized and cohesive than design, the mode has been for those in the field to complain amongst themselves, preaching to the choir, but not making attempts to publicly counter the capitalist tide. In the months leading up to the Milan Fair for 2015, individual designers, collectives, and critics began sounding out. Jasper Morrison, one of the prominent British designers, called it the, quote, Salone del Marketing. Alice Rothshorn, one of the prominent design critics, wrote in Freeze magazine that it, quote, reinforced the popular stereotype of design as a superficial, stylistic tool steeped in commercialism and consumerism, end quote. The French design firm Moustache sent a video of their works to Milan this year rather than attend in person, and many more continued to opt out. The list goes on. Tellingly, the decision by the industrial designer Helian Garius and the educator, curator, and critic Louise Schoenberg to write, they, their decision was to write and release a manifesto at the Salone. Hella did not show anything new, but rather a reworked version of her polder sofa, which you can see here. And the usual prominence of Dutch designers, many trained at Eindhoven, where Schoenberg is head of the master's program of contextual design, was not in evidence. So here is the manifesto in living color. Um, it was an object. It feels good to be able to graphically have, physically have something and see the graphics of it. And it folds out to this poster that you see on the right hand side and it was free and distributed throughout the fair. Called Beyond the New, 
a search for ideals in design, it voiced the opinions that had been percolating over the past year, addressing the larger context of the design world, and invoking, as Iris and I were talking about a little earlier today, a common sense approach, gosh forbid. By releasing their manifesto as a designed object, they consciously associated themselves with the historical precedents of the early 20th century. Broadly speaking, their manifesto urged designers to take the lead in changing the economic-driven mentality of design by, quote, creating a better balance between high quality, unfettered creativity, enthusiastic experimentation, social responsibility, and economic factors, end quote. And it was literally all that anybody could talk about in Milan last week, and probably all that anybody will talk about for the next few months to come. So why is this? Is what they advocate for so revolutionary? It's really not. It's really common sense. But what the text does, which all good manifestos or great manifestos do, is provide leadership in a field that craves it. So here's just some examples of Hella's work for those of you who are not familiar with her. I think that many of the statements in the manifesto have equal application for craft artists as well as designers. And so what I've decided to do in the essence of time is to look at three of these statements in a little bit more of an in-depth manner. So I'm going to insert the, the words and craft um, after design in these statements. So here's number one. Design and craft are not about products. Design and craft are about relationships. Good design and craft can draw, almost invisibly, on different levels of meaning to communicate with users. It suggests a lack of imagination when these opportunities are not exploited to the fullest. Sounds pretty good, right? We, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna illustrate these um, statements with images of work that I think fit the bill, that offer layers of information, that are communicative, um, that are about relationships, whether it's between the object and the user or the object and the, um, the world at large. Someone like Matthias Merkel Hess, who uh, very simply casts a um, ubiquitous gas can, but in his choice of glaze is referencing the history of spatterware in American ceramics of the 18th century, and equally thinking about the role of the superobject in modern and contemporary art. Someone like Claire Toomey, um, who has uh, based this work piece by piece off of 18th century Commedia dell'arte figures made by Meissen, in particular in the 18th century. These are from the Gardner Museum, and who has um, created a work that not only takes these models, which were figures of dancers, of entertainers, of harlequins, et cetera, but who has, um, so has arranged them in a large installation, grouping them by activity, dancers together relating to um, other kinds of frolickers, uh, harlequins, actors, et cetera, but who has engaged in that relationship economy in which artists were given the materials to create these figures on site during the exhibition, and at the end of the exhibition, every single one of these was given away. Someone like Vivian Beer, who is also um, giving you different layer of meaning with her pattern recognition tuffet, um, one of her more recent works in um, the laser carving on this tuffet stool. And um, for those of you who recognize the term pattern recognition, that was a terrible way of saying it, know the, the book, um, Pattern Recognition, which deals with um, the use of imagery in public life and how those images can be co-opted. It's a, a great science fiction uh, novel from uh, about eight or nine years ago. And then on a more 
well, literal way of thinking about relationships. Um, this is Nendo's part of their presentation, the Japanese Design Collective at Milan this year, in which if you look at each one of these rows as a series of relationships, um, and you can read that either left to right or right to left, you can see how with table forms or chair forms or cabinets, this combining and interrelationship changes as it collapses and expands. So a different um, thinking about the nature of family within objects. The next statement. Aesthetic value is a potent means of communication. Ugliness is also a potent means of communication. Without aesthetic refinement and without friction at the boundaries of aesthetics, there can be no personal signature and no intimate relationship with the user. Reed Shepard's Rat Coin Purse from 2013, Jolie Led, you know, I'm perversely attracted to this object. It repels me, it creeps me out, and yet I think it's absolutely brilliant. And there is so much to talk about with this taxidermied rat that you can carry as your coin purse. Um, Hannah Hedman's necklace here, Black Vile, and her interest in that play between darkness, evil, light, beauty, thinking about indigenous objects and talismanic objects. There is great frisson here between the ugly and the beauty. And um, in fact, it forces you, it confronts you to look deeper into the object to find meaning. I would say the same thing on the opposite end of the spectrum with um, Misha Khan's Saturday morning series in which he has used um, vinyl for the frames. Each one references a specific frame type, often historically based, and he's paradigm it created parodies of these historical forms. He pours hot glass on tin foil to create these effects and sees um, these works as sort of, um, he sees himself as a cultural outsider, but sees these works as making commentary on the kind of POMO historicism of the 1980s. Studio Yob, um, one of the, the Dutch design collective whose work is often held up as the, the whipping boy for this play between um, layers of information through pop culture, um, overly bedazzled and bejeweled and ugliness as an aesthetic message. And here you have uh, King Kong who is climbing the um, Burj Khalifa in Dubai and that is sitting atop Petra here. Here's your clock, here's your lamp. I couldn't find a picture of it illuminated. I think nobody dared to take one. It would just sort of push it way too much over the edge. And this is large scale. This is not a table clock. You know, this is, this is a, a, like a standing grandfather clock scale. Our next statement. By means of its language and employment of techniques, good design and craft expresses both the zeitgeist and a deep awareness of the past. This is one example from a series that Francesca Di Matteo made for an exhibition in Houston at the Blaffer Gallery just this past year, um, which speaks to historic blue and white porcelain the idea of dining customs, uh, particularly in the 18th century, when um, your tureens uh, or other serving pieces would have finials that would signal the kind of foodstuffs you would find inside of it, um, mashed up with more contemporary cultural references. And here is an artist who was trained as a painter, decided to work in clay, has the good fortune of having Kurt Weiser as her father-in-law, and so actually gets properly trained, um, but then comes back to create these sort of uh, these new type of forms, but that have a very much a deep reference for the past. 
The same thing can be said for Michael Petrie's um, mirror, bad restoration mirror here. Petrie in 2011, 2012, had a residency at Sir John Soane's Museum in London. For those of you who have not been there, it is an incredible historic home that's sort of a living, breathing cabinet of curiosities that has not been touched since the day of Sir John Soane. So um, he took reference from the crumbling nature of many of the artifacts there in creating um, a new object that um, references its historic precedent. And Jaden Moore on the right-hand side who takes silver plate platters, in this case, um, ones with the same pattern but that have different rims, cuts them up, solders them together to create something new, but that deeply has its echoes of historic past, not only in terms of the material and the patterning, but also he has literally created a large platter out of platter, so you have that semblance of function as well. In a more very straightforward way, um, what Gesina Hackenberg has been doing with um, Delft Blue Porcelain and cutting out segments to create necklaces, or in this case, earrings. Anya Kavarkas, who has made a career of mining historical precedents, most recently for her September issue, uh, earrings, in which she was looking at a Vogue issue from the 1930s, the heyday of Art Deco jewelry, and recreating forms out of silver here. Sherry Mendelssohn, who uses our um, ever-present water bottles, such as this, cuts off the bottom, shapes them, glues them, and references historic Roman glass in doing so. These are absolutely brilliant, made from uh, discarded bottles. And then finally, um, for any textile people out there, um, Marcel Wanders in Milan last week released a series of photorealistic carpets. And 80% of them were based on historic images. Images of old master paintings, architectural elements, or stonework, as you can see here. So that continuing um, addressing of the past and its power as a visual statement and all the information that is encoded in it, but in a new object. So I hope that you can see just by those three examples, because I'm running out of time, that um, Jungarius and Schoenberg's take home messages are clear, but they still leave room for expansion and interpretation. As with Bruce Sterling's text, their manifesto imagines a future aesthetic while accounting for what happens, what is happening today. Both manifestos are intellectual rather than emotional, unafraid of the broader context, and redefining rather than drawing a hard line in the sand. And the reactions to both texts took their times into account rather than the personal, dismissive, and close-minded responses that Littman, Jacob, Vinya, and Willman's text engendered. Does this signify a fundamental difference between the design and craft fields, or are their wildly opposite reactions simply a product of individual personalities and the time in which the manifesto was delivered? I have no idea, and it's something that we can discuss and debate probably forever, certainly after this talk. So I wanna leave you um, this evening, because I know there are so many artists and designers in the field, with um, one final thought from Jungarius and Schoenberg's manifesto. And again, the and craft is my insertion. Good design and craft entails research. Good design and craft equals research. We owe it to the field to reflect on our own practices again and again, and to investigate every component again and again. Design and craft require a constant search for idioms, a battle against presuppositions, a push of the limits, and the continual refinement of responses to fundamental questions like, 
What can design and craft add to the world of plenty? What is functionality in the here and now? I look forward to seeing, for all of the artists and designers in the audience, your responses to these questions in the objects that you will create tomorrow and for years to come. Thank you. <laughs>